Welcome to Bonnie's Beat. I'm your host, Bonnie Squires, and we're coming to you from Radnor Studio 21 in beautiful downtown Wayne. And as usual, we always have somebody important in the studio, and we'd like to inform you about politics, about academia, about charities, current events, and so on. And we've got somebody who's a real headline maker today with us, State Senator Dalen Leach. Hi, Dalen. Hey, Bonnie. Good to be with you. Thank you. for. I know you should be doing an Olympic sport now. Uh, but <laughs> yes, the pole vault I, <laughs> I, I was going to, but I decided to be here instead. So Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. Anyway, you people have been seeing you on MSNBC frequently, especially talking about the uh, Pennsylvania voter ID law, right? Mm -hmm. What's your opinion of the photo <laughs> voter ID law? Uh, it's not a good one. Uh, oh. It's complicated, and let me see if I can lay it out quickly and concisely and in and, and, and an understandable way. But a lot of people think, well, voter ID is reasonable. We should, you know, um, you know, people, a lot of people have IDs. It shouldn't be that big a deal. But first of all, it's, it, it is, was passed to solve a problem. It, it was claimed, that they claimed to be passing it to solve a problem, which we now know never happens. Um, keep in mind, uh, people talk about voter fraud. There's a lot of different types of theoretical voter fraud. Almost none of them would be addressed by voter ID. Someone voting twice in different counties, a Democrat voting in a Republican primary or vice versa. Um, you know, uh, illegal immigrants voting. None of that would be addressed. Dead people voting. Dead people voting. The only, there's only one type of uh, fraud that would be addressed by voter ID, uh, photo ID, which is voter impersonation. In other words, I show up at a poll pretending to be someone I am not in order to get a vote I do not deserve. If you go into your polling place and claim to be Robert Redford, right away they'll know because you don't have... I'm more of a Brad Pitt <laughs> Oh, okay, that's true. Guy. I forgot. Uh, but no, <laughs> in, in, in fact, it's a very... First of all, if I did that and I was caught, it's five years in prison. It's a federal felony. Oh, okay? I didn't realize that. Oh, yeah. So uh, it's a very high-risk crime in that sense. It's also a very easy crime to detect. I mean, keep in mind, if I go in trying to impersonate John Smith. I have to know several things. I have to know John Smith is registered to vote at that poll. I have to know he's not already voted that day. I have to know that none of the six or seven people who are at the poll every day from that neighborhood recognize John Smith and say, you're not John Smith. And then I have to sign the voter book uh, with a signature that approximates John Smith's signature. If I get any of that wrong, I'm going to prison for five years. Now, sometimes people risk prison uh, but usually it's for things like, you know, bank robbery, because if you're successful, <laughs> you get a lot of money, okay? Here, what do you get if you're successful? You get one lousy vote in an election that's likely to be decided by hundreds, thousands, or millions of votes. Because it's a presidential year. But even if it's a not a presidential year, yeah. even if it's a township commissioner, most of those are not decided by one, two, or three votes, very rare. Uh, and so what am I gaining from doing that? What you would expect with such a high-risk, low-reward crime is that it never happens. In fact, the Bush administration uh, and the Brennan Center and a number of other groups all did separate studies and they found no incidents, zero incidents of voter impersonation to the point where the lawsuit that's uh, claiming that this is an unconstitutional law, the state of Pennsylvania, Governor Corbett, who pushed this law, admitted in a written document that there would be not one, no evidence of a single case of voter fraud in the last 10 years in Pennsylvania of the type that voter ID would address. So that's zero cases. So it's a problem that doesn't exist, which will cost us $11 million to solve. Only okay. 11 million. Well, and it's interesting. Well, we're rolling in dough rolling, in the state well, legislature, you know, right? It's, it's interesting. I met with the governor <laughs> about uh, a Chester Upland School District, which was in danger of going uh, under. He, he agreed to meet with a Democrat? It, well, it was a, it's a complicated uh, series of events that led to that. But he said, Said, look, I wish we could help, but we don't have any money at all. There's no money for these poor kids. Suddenly, mm, yes. eleven million dollars <laughs> so comes for this voter ID out of nowhere. Now, so if there, if this is a problem that never happens, why was it passed? And I know why it was passed. I even have candid conversation with the people who passed it, uh, who you know were very open about why they passed it. They passed it because. Uh, there's a large group of people that tend not to have photo IDs. Most people, when they have photo IDs, it's their driver's license. That's what I have. Uh, there's a large number of people who don't have driver's licenses. Who are those people? They're, they tend to be poor people who can't afford cars. Senior citizens. Senior citizens who are too old to drive, haven't driven for a long time. Minorities. Minorities who live in inner cities and therefore walk everywhere and don't, can't afford to pay for the car. 
and students who are you know transient and going living on campuses those groups conveniently enough tend to vote overwhelmingly democratic not you know, 80 90 percent um, and so what's happened is we, we have this bill passed and you know uh, uh, the leader of the house who actually put this bill on the floor said it out loud very candidly and, he and said, was taped saying it and it's been on national news yeah. Mike Terzai Mike Terzai and he, he said a Republican I have to point that out I'm sorry we passed this bill to enable Mitt Romney to win Pennsylvania okay Ouch. by disenfranchising people now how many people will be disenfranchised there's a lot of discussion and dispute about it but the state admits who's defending this law 758,000 uh, people. people. We think it's higher. We think their list is inaccurate. We think it's up to 1.2 million. But 758,000, they admit, including one out of every four African Americans in Pennsylvania, one out of every five people in Philadelphia, uh, one out of every five senior citizens, um, almost a third of people over 80 the, the, are going to be disenfranchised by this law. An awfully uh, dramatic remedy to solve a problem and again the state admits never happens. I'll tell you I had a little agita recently. I got an email from a friend who's... You should explain what agita means first. <laughs> <laughs> Heartburn mm -hmm. because um, a friend of mine who's active in the Democratic Party they've been doing a cross-referencing between the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation to see whose voter registration name matches the name on the driver's license. And when I signed up to register a few years ago, you know, sweet young thing that I was, <laughs> I signed my name as Bonnie S. Squires. Yeah. S was for my maiden name. I pulled out and, and I get this email saying, your name doesn't match. Is there a substantial difference between your voter registration ID and your driver's license? I pull out my driver's license. It just says Bonnie Squires. It doesn't have the initial. And I read either a letter to the editor or an article today with someone who had the same problem, uh, my friend who's an elected official doesn't think that'll be a problem. Let me ask you, do you think that'll be a problem? Uh, this is the problem. There, there's, there's so many problems with this. I mean, I ran that polling place for 40 years. They all know me. Well, yeah, well, that, that, that doesn't matter. It doesn't um, matter. <laughs> unfortunately. Right. But I will tell you, uh, uh, women who, who are married are going to be one of the uh, the big target victims of this, and of course they intend to vote Democratic too, which is unfortunate from the people who pass the bill perspective. But so, for example, let's say you were uh, married. Let's say your name you were born Jane Smith, okay, and you registered to vote when you're 18. A good citizen is Jane Smith. You then married Harvey Jones, so now you're Jane Jones. You took his name, all right. You show up with a photo ID that says Jane Jones, and your name is Jane Smith. You're not going to be able to vote. You need to do something about that between now and the election. But, but, um, even if the, the middle initial, what well, you're talking about, substantial similarity. The law says if the name is substantially similar, then you can still vote. However, that is a decision which is going to be made by individual judges at elections at polling places, which means you'll have one uh, exact same set of circumstances at one poll, they'll be allowed to vote. Same set of circumstances at another poll, they won't be allowed to vote based on individual decisions of local judges of elections. So you're, it's, it is going to be an utter mess on election And long, election day. long lines. Well, the lines is actually another very troubling Big thing. Big problem. In, in presidential elections, we tend to have very long lines in certain areas, especially inner cities. Two-hour lines, you know. And so the the prediction is there's going to be a lot of poll watchers who never were there before but are going to be there this time and they're going to challenge every voter under this new law oh. well, let me see here let me see that uh, the, the middle initial I'm not sure you don't look like this picture doesn't look like you they can challenge it on a whole bunch of bases and they have to sort it through with the judge of election so a two-hour line then becomes a four-hour line and, and if people it's raining, start going home if it's raining or even if it's sunny, yeah, people are going to wait four hours. They're going to go home. And you know, the thing that really gets to me is that you know, yesterday was the anniversary of Lyndon Johnson signing the Voting Rights Act, uh, and and you know, which which gave the vote to millions of people, African Americans, who never had it before. That's the direction we should be going in this country. It was a great day for this country, and we are going backwards. Uh, taking the right to vote away from people simply to so to, to, to for partisan to win the election, which is to me just obscene. Now people say, why don't people go get these IDs? It, 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 again, first of all, some people literally can't. I spoke to an African American gentleman who said, 
because you need a birth certificate. To, and if you weren't born here. Yeah. Well, he was were, born in North Carolina. And he right. said, I was born to a midwife in North Carolina. There is no birth certificate. So he's not going to, he's been voting for 30 years in Pennsylvania, but will not be able to vote uh, this, this, this election. Puerto Rico, if you were born in Puerto Rico, they to give you a birth certificate, they require a driver's license. So you have to have a photo <laughs> ID to get the, 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 the document, to get the photo ID to vote. It's, uh, there's so many stories like this. It is, it is just insane. Um, uh, this is being challenged. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the state put up a very weak case, uh, you know, and we'll see what the judge does. But Well, you're an attorney, so you can judge well, if, whether uh, or not. Well, look, uh, not to get too arcane on the law, but voting is a fundamental right. Uh, not only under the federal constitution, the state constitution has a specific provision saying you have a right to vote. This is a fundamental right. If it's a fundamental right, a challenge, the law has to withstand what's called strict scrutiny. Essentially, it means the state has to prove that there's a compelling interest in this law. It's hard to find a compelling interest in a law that solves a problem that doesn't exist. And uh, that there's a very tight fit between the law and that interest, which means there can't be a lot of collateral damage. Here, all 758,000 at least people are collateral damage. It's all collateral damage. Since there's no actual cases of voter impersonation, everyone who's disenfranchised is an innocent person. Well, there's another aspect of this crazy law, and that is if someone challenges your photo ID, you would be allowed to fill out a, quote, provisional ballot. Mm -hmm. But in order for the provisional ballot to count, <coughs> They give you seven days, six. six days only, to collect all the information, the documentation, and take it to what you know the county seat. And if not, they throw your ballot in the trash. You have six that doesn't sound fair. No, it's crazy. I'll tell you why. For, you have six days. You can cast a provisional ballot if you don't have your photo ID. Photo ID. And then you have to show it within six days. Now, that, that's only going to help you if you left it at home. If you don't have one, it's not going to help you. It takes you two to four weeks to get a birth certificate. You need a Social Security card that takes 10 days. The six days isn't going to help you at all. But even if you forgot it at home, even if you have the photo ID or whatever, you didn't bring it, and you cast a provisional ballot, you have to bring it to the voter registration office. In some counties, that's an hour away. Okay. Now, keep in mind, often these are people who don't drive. They don't have driver's licenses. They right. don't drive. Some counties, or they're disabled. Some counties don't even have their own voter registration office, okay? So they would have to go two counties over to, 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 to oh. show it. Um, or they're disabled. So if you're a frail 80 years old who doesn't drive, walks on a walker, they're going to say, yeah, great, uh, you got to show us your thing in six days. Um, uh, uh, you got to drive uh, 92 miles or somehow get 92 miles away and do this. And, you know, it's not going to happen. A few people will will brave all of that maybe and but the great thing about voter suppression is you don't have to suppress every vote if you just reduce it 30 or 40 percent that's going to make a huge difference um, and this is going to make a difference of hundreds of thousands of votes in this state and you know even if look you can be a democrat or republican even if you want the republicans to win the election you can't think it's a good idea to do it by making it so your fellow citizens some of them are veterans some of whom fought for this country uh, so people who've worked their whole lives can't vote. I mean, no, no one can think that's a good idea. Nobody talks about fairness and equity a lot these days, right? But I wanted to switch to focus more clearly on the presidential election because four years ago, <coughs> excuse me, um, almost every elected official, at least in southeastern Pennsylvania, was a Hillary Clinton supporter. And I remember going to a big Democratic event and I see Senator Leach, and he's coming out as a surrogate for Obama. And I always wondered how you were clairvoyant enough to get on the Obama train when Rendell and Nutter and so many other people, including myself, were on the Hillary train. Well, I was just so much smarter than everybody. Well, I mean, I we think always know thing. that, Dale. But no, you know, it's, I mean, it's, in all seriousness, it's the first time I've ever gotten lucky. Um, I've been supporting presidential candidates since I was 11 years old. That's a long time. Uh, usually, as soon as I endorse a presidential candidate, they either um, 
uh, spontaneously combust um, <laughs> or, or, or like get kidnapped by druids or something. I mean, they, they or, or just drop out of the race immediately. I, I, have a lo I have a long line of losing candidates behind me. Uh, I got very lucky with Obama, and it's cool to be. I found out it's good to be right, because as a result of being right, I got to do some cool things. I got to obviously got to be a delegate to the convention. I got to be a member of the Electoral College, which is oh. for someone who cares about history. That was really cool. Um, I got. I had a debate party, and the campaign because I'd done a lot of work for the campaign called me, and they said, "Would you like a surrogate? A surrogate is like a famous or quasi-famous person." to come to your house to like, you know, make the party, give it a little more pizzazz. And I was like, well, who do you got? And they said, well, we can send Carol King over. I'm like, Carol <laughs> King? I'm like, sure. <laughs> so <laughs> Carol King uh, came over um, and, uh, you know, hung out and, uh, you know, we wrote some songs. But um, it's, uh, so that was, that was a lot of fun. Did you I, play I, your guitar for her? <clears throat> uh, yeah, I, acapella. <laughs> That's where I really shine is acapella. Uh, but uh, so that was fun. Um, but uh, you know, look, uh, it, it's uh, well. What attracted you to Obama? I had heard him speak a couple of years before he announced he was running. He was the keynote speaker at the um, at the National Education Association mm -hmm. convention in Philadelphia, and I was given press credentials. And he was absolutely mesmerizing, the most brilliant speaker. But I went up to shake hands with him afterwards. And he looked so young. He looked like a bar mitzvah boy. I said, nah, I'm sticking with Hillary. You know, I was with Hillary in 95 in Beijing. And she's just, she was a remarkable first lady. She's a remarkable yeah. senator. And um, I'll tell you, it was, I mean, I was in the VIP section of the hotel the night that Hillary won the Pennsylvania primary. It was so exciting. And then, like, by two days later, She's telling everybody, okay, shift and support Obama. I didn't have any problem shifting to support Obama, but I thought, how did you know <laughs> to be on? What is it that I'm still, attracted I'm still you to him? I'm still hung up on your thinking Obama looked like a bar mitzvah boy. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm just mulling that over in my mind. No, I, I was attracted. I, I, like, I like, you know, I was very attracted to his intelligence. Uh, I, I, I'm a big fan of that. Well, um, Hillary, and Hillary, no, is look, this is genius. nothing. Against, this is nothing against Hillary. Um, I just felt that we needed, you know, there, there was also a part of me, and again, there was no, but we, it had been Clinton, then Bush, no, it had been Bush, then Clinton, then Bush, then it was Clinton again. I felt like America was becoming almost a, not an aristocracy, but like a, like I like the idea that a fresh face, a minority. Who had been, you know, grown up fairly poor like I did, you know, had a, had a, you know, as he said, a skinny kid with a funny name. Um, <laughs> I'm a, you know, less skinny kid with a funny name. I like to think that we we have, uh, you know, our chances too. It seemed like there was the the system was becoming too closed. It only like sort of the royal families of American That's politics could run. I'll so, tell you, I, I spent four days in Washington. I'm sure you were there too. Uh, for all the festivities surrounding Obama's the inaugural. inauguration. Sure. And I'll tell you, you didn't need any policemen because everybody was so thrilled to have the first African, everybody was there, the first African-American president. People were hugging and kissing, and there was like no barrier between black, white, Asian, Hispanic. It was the most heady, wonderful experience. But here we are three and a half years later, and hate, seems to be the operative word. You know, it's very interesting. Uh, I, I'm reading a book now, a very thick book, um, on the New Deal. Uh, and there are so many, forgetting the, the policy issues, there's so many parallels uh, in terms of the rhetoric. You know, people forget, but when Roosevelt was president, he was routinely called a socialist. He was routinely called... All the things, uh, not Kenyan, that's new, but he was routinely, routine, routinely called all the things Obama is called. We had, you know, uh, the same level of vitriol in many respects. It's more effectively distributed now. Like now, someone says something crazy about Roosevelt, it might hit the papers a week later or something on page 26. Now, it's on your Twitter feed immediately. Yes. It goes viral. So it seems more intense. Um, but there, there, there has always been this strain of, that sort of thing. Uh, I mean, the hatred of Roosevelt was really intense back then. Do you and personally 
believe in launching negative ads? Well, I, I don't, I, in, in my campaigns, I've not run negative ads. Um, I, 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 I was going to say, I couldn't think of I any. I have so much positive to say about myself. <laughs> um, also, I mean, usually my opponents are so negative that it's almost the contrast does me good. I mean, you know, people are like, you know, you can't be that insane, you know. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, and, and frankly, you know, look, I'm happy to be a senator, but if, if people are another senator, that's fine. Uh, I'll do something else. It's not worth it to me to, like, run ads I think I consider to be icky, you know, just for my own uh, self-image and my own view of what politics should be. But that doesn't mean you can't defend yourself. I mean, if someone says that, you know, uh, I was involved in the, you know, the, the Lindbergh baby kidnapping. I think I should be able to say, well, actually, I wasn't. I you wasn't know. even born. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, uh, the, the, I, I think it is unfortunate. I think negative ads are becoming less, much less valuable. That doesn't mean they're not, they don't work at all. But especially when there's a huge disparity in resources. Like in the primaries, Romney was able to swamp each of his serial opponents with negative ads. And it worked because they couldn't respond even in positive terms. They just didn't have the money. But given relative equal resources, yeah, I just don't know. I think they're talking to 3% of the population. In the presidential race anyway, I think they're talking about 3% of the population and probably not in Pennsylvania. <laughs> so, I mean, it's like six states. The, the truly undecided are about 3 or 4%. And that's what everything is being directed towards. So, you know. Florida, Virginia. The six states I see are Florida, North Carolina, Virginia, Ohio, Nevada, and Colorado. Those are the six states I think they, the campaigns are really focusing on. Uh, Pennsylvania, Romney has seemed to largely pull out of Pennsylvania. Um, not opening field offices, not investing in, the, uh, in advertising at the rate he would need to to make the state competitive. That doesn't mean it can't change if something happens. And we're going to see, which I think is a terrible development, again, to, regardless of what party you are, uh, we have the Supreme Court decision in Citizens United, oh. which basically says that we can have all of this... Uh, uh, secret super PAC secret money. Secret super PAC money. We don't know who's giving. We don't know. They but don't all we know reveal. is billionaires are giving hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean... You know the, Co the Koch brothers the Koch and brothers, Adelson. Adelson and those and that are the Foster top Freeze. of the list. I mean, they 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 can drown out one guy can drown out the voices of a hundred million Americans, um, uh, and three to one, four to one over a hundred million Americans. So um, it, it's. We, we, I think you're going to see a huge distortion of the process. On the other side of the coin, I am deluged, like every half hour with another solicitation for funds for Democrats, mostly for the Obama campaign. Everybody has my email address, Al Franken, because once you Have give to them... Have I sent you them, money for my campaign? Uh, I gave, I gave, I gave. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Al Franken and Michelle Obama and President Obama and uh, and um, Bob Menendez, yeah, right. Send five dollars. Dinner with George Clooney. And you, right, right. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, if I if I were guaranteed, then I <laughs> might, you know. But uh, it bothers me that the Democrats should be fighting against this this obscene amount of money that's being spent. The, uh, you know, but they're they're doing the same thing. The problem is they I have mean, to keep up. I know. It, yeah, yeah it, you have a real dilemma <coughs> in the campaign. You know, do you tilt at windmills or do you? Because if you unilaterally disarm, it's, you know, I mean, I, I support public financing of campaigns. I don't think we should be allowed to raise money. I don't think I should be allowed to go to the chemical industry and say, give me money, and they give me $10,000, and then I vote on stuff that matters to the chemical industry. I use them because they haven't actually given me $10,000 or anything. But, <laughs> but you're hoping. But, well, you know, uh, <laughs> man can dream. The point is that... I don't think that should, and there's some states where that's, you know, where they've tried to have public financing in campaigns. But um, even though I don't think we should be allowed to raise money, I raise money because the law is we can raise money, in fact, have to. If no one, so uh, you can't unilaterally disarm. You've just got to try to, you know, fight with the rules that are in place now and then fight for change within that, within those parameters. What is your chief issue in the Pennsylvania legislature? And then we'll turn our attention to what you, your dream wish is 
for Congress? Okay, well, I, I, there's a few issues. You know, I've, I've sort of serially been involved in a number of issues. Uh, education, uh, there have been a lot of assaults on public education this year. Uh. Uh, the last session, the last two years have been just a dramatic series of assaults, really by people who, again, are very open when you discuss in private. They want to eliminate public education. They don't believe there should be what they call government schools. Um, and so fighting protect protect what I think is one of the key uh, elements uh, holding it's a building block society of our together. Society. Absolutely. Um, and provides opportunity to people um, that otherwise wouldn't have it. So uh, public education, I'm on the education committee, that's been big. We've been dealing with a lot of environmental issues with the fracking uh, stuff that's been going on. And we're the only state in the nation that doesn't really tax those billion dollar companies oh, with the Marcellus share. Sarah Palin has a 6.1% tax. <laughs> Governor Perry of Texas you know, who's not a flaming liberal, 7.5%, okay? Our tax is essentially zero at the state level. We have a, allow them to do a sort of a user fee at the local level, which is an effective rate of, a, you know, under 2%. So it's, it's um, you know, it's Christmas morning for the drilling industry here in Pennsylvania. <laughs> there's no doubt about that. Plus there's all the other provisions we've done in the, uh, you know, lack of environmental enforcement and all of that. So we also have to talk about Penn State and what you think the future of Penn State is, and how do we guarantee that no ta tax dollars are used to pay off the zillions that they're going to owe when the civil uh, cases come to, to fruition? Yeah, that's really a tragic story in so many oh. ways. It's not oh. only tragic for the victims, obviously, but it's tragic for the institution, uh, which is a great institution, and for the students and alumni of that institution. Um, you know, uh, I think I, I think that the idea of pulling back from football as a priority is a good idea. Um, but we want to make sure we, that the institution itself, which has become a really an academic uh, leading light uh, over the last few years, uh, is not damaged in a permanent way. Uh, and you have to be very thoughtful about that. Uh, you're, you're right. I, the civil liability is almost inconsemplatable, which is a word I have trouble <laughs> even saying. Um, but, uh, and, uh, you know, we, we also have to get to the bottom of sort of how this happened, how for years how and years. How it was allowed to happen. You know, for years and years, there was a and guy that many people knew were, was involved in uh, hurting children. Hurting, that's what he does. You know, so he's being convicted of but it. But also. And was allowed to continue to do it um, year after year after year. Governor Corbett's going to have to deal with his role or his lack of a role when he was attorney general and all this was going on and he never you know i mean i heard his defense he was i heard a sound clip from the governor where he said well i assume that sandusky knew we were investigating him well how would he know if he was never told and i didn't think he would have the nerve to attack any more children well how many more children were attacked yeah. while this alleged investigation was going on and the governor's going to have to answer to that when he runs for re-election well i mean we we there, there are a lot of questions raised by all of this we want to be careful not to jump to conclusions before evidence is in but obviously we need to look into all of this it's not only governor corbett but we've got to look oh, into yeah. the whole system where a guy who had you know the, the entire hierarchy of penn state knew what he was doing and yet Oh, Judge uh, Justice Freeze, scathing report. Yeah, two hundred seventy-five. But yet he was pages. allowed to have open yeah. access to the showers. At the, they at didn't the, take away his key. They didn't take away. So there's a there's a lot of issues. That that was a that was a again a catastrophe. Yeah, it's uh, and you know and I have friends that still they bleed blue and white, not red and white. Yeah. They still, you know, they're they're Penn State. What is it? They, they proudly proclaim we are Penn State. Which is great. I mean, Penn yeah. State has an awful lot to be proud of. And it's important we not taint. And the professors had nothing to do yeah, with right. that. And the students. I mean, yeah. it's important we not taint the accomplishments of the university academically, um, economically, and otherwise right. um, with the actions of this. But that, the, we, Nor do we whitewash uh, the, the malfeasance or the lack of action uh, when it was called for on the part of people in power. So uh, it's, this is going to require a thoughtful process going forward. What's the biggest joy? We've got a few seconds left. What's your biggest joy in b serving as a state senator? Every once in a while you have a small victory uh, which makes people's lives better and you feel really good about that.
oh, I I'm surprised to hear you turn serious on me, <laughs> Dale. <and Maggie. laughs> well, plus, the, you know, it's uh, <laughs> all the just the the uh, the mobs of, of fa adoring of, fans, adoring fans <laughs> as I walk down the street. There's that too. Well, our guest today has been State Senator Dale and Leach, and thank you for illuminating so many interesting subjects. And we'll see you again next week.